Book Two, Chapter One, Part Two of Three of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, Chapter One The Radiant Hour. Part Two of Three. The Ushers. Six young men in Cross Patch's library, growing more and more cheery under the influence of Mum's Extra Dry, set surreptitiously in cold pails by the bookcases. The first young man. By golly, believe me, in my next book I'm going to do a wedding scene that'll knock em cold. The second young man. Met a debutante the other day and said she thought your book was powerful. As a rule, young girls cry for this primitive business. The third young man. Where's Anthony? The fourth young man. Walking up and down outside, talking to himself. Second young man. Lord, did you see the minister? Most peculiar-looking teeth. Fifth young man. I think they're natural. Funny thing people have in gold teeth. Sixth young man. They say they love them. My dentist told me once a woman came to him and insisted on having two of her teeth covered with gold. No reason at all all right the way they were. Fourth young man. Here you got a book out, Dicky. Congratulations. Dick, stiffly. Thanks. Fourth young man, innocently. What is it, college stories? Dick, more stiffly. No, not college stories. Fourth young man. Pity. Hasn't been a good book about Harvard for years. Dick, touchily. Why don't you supply the lack? Third young man. I think I saw a squad of guests turn the drive in a Packard just now. Sixth young man. Might open a couple more bottles on the strength of that. Third young man. It was the shock of my life when I heard the old man was going to have a wet wedding. Rabid prohibitionist, you know. Fourth young man, snapping his fingers excitedly. By gad, I knew I'd forgotten something. Kept thinking it was my vest. Dick. What was it? Fourth young man. By gad! By gad! Sixth young man. Here! Here! Why the tragedy? Second young man. Would you forget? The way home? Dick. Maliciously. He forgot the plot for his book of Harvard stories. Fourth young man. No, sir, I forgot the present, by George. I forgot to buy old Anthony a present. I kept putting it off and putting it off, and by gad, I've forgotten it. What'll they think? Sixth young man facetiously. That's probably what's been holding up the wedding. The fourth young man looks nervously at his watch. Laughter. Fourth young man. By gad! What an ass I am! Second young man. What do you make of that bridesmaid who thinks she's Nora Bays? Kept telling me she wished this was a ragtime wedding. Name's Haynes or Hampton. Dick. Hurriedly spurring his imagination. Cain, you mean. Muriel Cain. She's a sort of debt of honor, I believe. Once saved Gloria from drowning, or something of the sort. Second young man. I didn't think she could stop that perpetual swaying long enough to swim. Fill up my glass, will you? Old man and I had a long talk about the weather just now. Maury. Who, old Adam? Second young man. No, the bride's father. He must be with a weather bureau. Dick. He's my uncle, Otis. Otis. Well, it's an honorable profession. Laughter. Sixth young man. Bride your cousin, isn't she? Dick. Yes, Cable, she is. Cable. She certainly is a beauty. Not like you, Dicky. Bet she brings old Anthony to terms. Maury. Why are all grooms given the title of old? I think marriage is an error of youth. Dick. Maury, the professional cynic. Maury. Why, you intellectual faker! Fifth young man. Battle of the highbrows here, Otis. Pick up what crumbs you can. Dick. Faker yourself. What do you know? Maury. What do you know? Dick. Ask me anything. Any branch of knowledge. Maury. All right. What's the fundamental principle of biology? Dick. You don't know yourself. Maury. Don't hedge. Dick. Well, natural selection? 
Maury, wrong. Dick, I give it up. Maury, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Fifth young man, take your base. Maury, ask you another. What's the influence of mice on the clover crop? Laughter. Fourth young man, what's the influence of rats on the decalogue? Maury, shut up, you saphead. There is a connection. Dick, what is it then? Maury, pausing a moment in growing disconcertation. Why, let's see. I seem to have forgotten exactly. Something about the bees eating the clover. Fourth young man. And the clover eating the mice. Ha ha! Maury, frowning. Let me just think a minute. Dick, sitting up suddenly. Listen! A volley of chatter explodes in the adjoining room. The six young men arise, feeling at their neckties. Dick, weightily. We'd better join the firing squad. They're going to take the picture, I guess. No, that's afterward. Otis. Cable, you take the ragtime bridesmaid. Fourth young man. I wish to God I'd sent that present. Maury. If you'll give me another minute, I'll think of that about the mice. Otis. I was usher last month for old Charlie McIntyre and... They move slowly toward the door as the chatter becomes a babble and the practicing preliminary to the overture issues in long, pious groans from Adam Patch's organ. Anthony There were five hundred eyes boring through the back of his cutaway, and the sun glinting on the clergyman's inappropriately bourgeois teeth. With difficulty he restrained a laugh. Gloria was saying something in a clear, proud voice, and he tried to think that the affair was irrevocable, that every second was significant that his life was being slashed into two periods, and that the face of the world was changing before him. He tried to recapture that ecstatic sensation of ten weeks before. All these emotions eluded him. He did not even feel the physical nervousness of that very morning. It was all one gigantic aftermath. And those gold teeth! He wondered if the clergyman were married. He wondered perversely if a clergyman could perform his own marriage service. But as he took Gloria into his arms, he was conscious of a strong reaction. The blood was moving in his veins now. A languorous and pleasant content settled like a weight upon him, bringing responsibility and possession. He was married. Gloria. So many, such mingled emotions, that no one of them was separable from the others. She could have wept for her mother, who was crying quietly back there ten feet, and for the loveliness of the June sunlight flooding in at the windows. She was beyond all conscious perceptions, only a sense, colored with delirious wild excitement, that the ultimately important was happening, and a trust, fierce and passionate, burning in her like a prayer, that in a moment she would be forever and securely safe. Late one night they arrived in Santa Barbara, where the night clerk at the Hotel Lafcadio refused to admit them on the grounds that they were not married. The clerk thought that Gloria was beautiful. He did not think that anything so beautiful as Gloria could be moral. Conamore. That first half-year, the trip west, the long months loiter along the California coast, and the gray house near Greenwich where they lived until late autumn made the country dreary. Those days, those places, saw the enraptured hours. The breathless idyll of their engagement gave way, first, to the intense romance of the more passionate relationship. The breathless idyll left them, fled on to other lovers. They looked around one day, and it was gone, how they scarcely knew. Had either of them lost the other in the days of the idyll, the love lost would have been ever to the loser, that dim desire without fulfillment, which stands back of all life, but magic must hurry on, and the lovers remain. The ideal passed, bearing with it its extortion of youth. Came a day when Gloria found that other men no longer bored her. Came a day when Anthony discovered that he could sit again late into the evening, talking with Dick of those tremendous abstractions that had once occupied his world. But, knowing that they had had the best of love, they clung to what remained. Love lingered, by way of long conversations at night into those stark hours when the mind thins and sharpens, and the borrowings from dreams become the stuff of all life, by way of deep and intimate kindnesses they develop toward each other, by way of their laughing at the same absurdities and thinking the same things noble and the same things sad. It was, first of all, a time of discovery. 
The things they found in each other were so diverse, so intermixed, and moreover, so sugared with love, as to seem at the time not so much discoveries as isolated phenomena, to be allowed for, and to be forgotten. Anthony found that he was living with a girl of tremendous nervous tension, and of the most high-handed selfishness. Gloria knew, within a month, that her husband was an utter coward toward any one of a million phantasms created by his imagination. Her perception was intermittent, for this cowardice sprang out, became almost obscenely evident, then faded and vanished as though it had been only a creation of her own mind. Her reactions to it were not those attributed to her sex. It roused her neither to disgust nor to a premature feeling of motherhood. Herself almost completely without physical fear, she was unable to understand, and so she made the most of what she felt to be his fear's redeeming feature, which was that, though he was a coward under a shock and a coward under a strain, when his imagination was given play, he had yet a sort of dashing recklessness that moved her on its brief occasions almost to admiration, and a pride that usually steadied him when he thought he was observed. The trait first showed itself in a dozen incidents of little more than nervousness, his warning to a taxi driver against fast driving in Chicago, his refusal to take her to a certain tough café she had always wished to visit. These, of course, admitted the conventional interpretation, that it was of her he had been thinking. Nevertheless, their culminative weight disturbed her. But something that occurred in a San Francisco hotel, when they had been married a week, gave the matter certainty. It was after midnight and pitch dark in their room. Gloria was dozing off, and Anthony's even breathing beside her made her suppose that he was asleep, when suddenly she saw him raise himself on his elbow and stare at the window. "'What is it, dearest?' she murmured. "'Nothing. He had relaxed to his pillow and turned toward her. "'Nothing, my darling wife. Don't say wife. I'm your mistress. Wife's such an ugly word. Your permanent mistress is so much more tangible and desirable. Come into my arms,' she added in a rush of tenderness. "'I can sleep so well, so well with you in my arms.' Coming into Gloria's arms had a quite definite meaning. It required that he should slide one arm under her shoulder, lock both arms about her, and arrange himself as nearly as possible as a sort of three-sided crib for her luxurious ease. Anthony, who tossed, whose arms went tinglingly to sleep after half an hour of that position, would wait until she was asleep and roll her gently over to her side of the bed. Then, left to his own devices, he would curl himself into his usual knots. Gloria, having attained sentimental comfort, retired into her doze. Five minutes ticked away on Blockman's traveling clock. Silence lay all about the room, over the unfamiliar, impersonal furniture, and the half-oppressive ceiling that melted imperceptibly into invisible walls on both sides. Then there was suddenly a rattling flutter at the window, staccato and loud upon the hushed, pent air. With a leap, Anthony was out of the bed and standing tense beside it. "'Who's there?' he cried, in an awful voice. Gloria lay very still, wide awake now, and engrossed not so much in the rattling as in the rigid, breathless figure whose voice had reached from the bedside into that ominous dark. The sound stopped. The room was quiet as before. Then Anthony, pouring words in at the telephone. "'Someone just tried to get into the room! There's someone at the window!' His voice was emphatic now, faintly terrified. All right, hurry! He hung up the receiver, stood motionless. There was a rush and commotion at the door, a knocking. Anthony went to open it upon an excited night clerk with three bellboys grouped staring behind him. Between thumb and finger the night clerk held a wet pen with the threat of a weapon. One of the bellboys had seized a telephone directory and was looking at it sheepishly. Simultaneously, the group was joined by the hastily summoned house detective, and as one man they surged into the room. Lights sprang on with a click. Gathering a piece of sheet about her, Gloria dove away from sight, shutting her eyes to keep out the horror of this unpremeditated visitation. There was no vestige of an idea in her stricken sensibilities save that her Anthony was at grievous fault. The night clerk was speaking from the window, his tone half of the servant, half of the teacher reproving a schoolboy. "'Nobody out there,' he declared conclusively. "'My golly, nobody could be out there. 
This here's a sheer fall to the street of fifty feet. It was the wind you heard, tugging at the blind. Oh. Then she was sorry for him. She wanted only to comfort him and draw him back tenderly into her arms, to tell them to go away because the thing their presence connotated was odious. Yet she could not raise her head for shame. She heard a broken sentence, apologies, conventions of the employee, and one unrestrained snicker from a bellboy. I've been just nervous as the devil all evening, Anthony was saying. Somehow that noise just shook me. I was only about half awake. Sure, I understand, said the night clerk with comfortable tact. Been that way myself. The door closed, the light snapped out. Anthony crossed the floor quietly and crept into bed. Gloria, feigning to be heavy with sleep, gave a quiet little sigh and slipped into his arms. What was it, dear? Nothing, he answered, his voice still shaken. I thought there was somebody at the window, so I looked out, but I couldn't see anyone and the noise kept up, so I phoned downstairs. Sorry if I disturbed you, but I'm awfully darn nervous tonight. Catching the lie, she gave an interior start. He had not gone to the window, nor near the window. He had stood by the bed, and then sent in his call of fear. Oh, she said, and then, I'm so sleepy. For an hour they lay awake side by side, Gloria with her eyes shut so tight that blue moons formed and revolved against backgrounds of deepest mauve, Anthony staring blindly into the darkness overhead. After many weeks it came gradually out into the light, to be laughed and joked at. They made a tradition to fit over it. Whenever that overpowering terror of the night attacked Anthony, she would put her arms around him and croon, soft as a song, I'll protect my Anthony. Oh, nobody's ever going to harm my Anthony. He would laugh as though it were a jest they played for their mutual amusement, but to Gloria it was never quite a jest. It was, at first, a keen disappointment. Later, it was one of the times when she controlled her temper. The management of Gloria's temper, whether it was aroused by a lack of hot water for her bath or by a skirmish with her husband, became almost the primary duty of Anthony's day. It must be done just so. By this much silence, by that much pressure, by this much yielding, by that much force. It was in her angers, with their attendant cruelties, that her inordinate egotism chiefly displayed itself. Because she was brave, because she was spoiled, because of her outrageous and commendable independence of judgment, and finally because of her arrogant consciousness that she had never seen a girl as beautiful as herself, Gloria had developed into a consistent, practicing Nietzschean. This, of course, with overtones of profound sentiment. There was, for example, her stomach. She was used to certain dishes, and she had a strong conviction that she could not possibly eat anything else. There must be a lemonade and tomato sandwich late in the morning, then a light lunch with a stuffed tomato. Not only did she require food from a selection of a dozen dishes, but in addition this food must be prepared in just a certain way. One of the most annoying half-hours of the first fortnight occurred in Los Angeles, when an unhappy waiter brought her a tomato stuffed with chicken salad instead of celery. "'We always serve it that way, madam,' he quavered to the gray eyes that regarded him wrathfully. Gloria made no answer, but when the waiter had turned discreetly away she banged both fists upon the table until the china and silver rattled. "'Poor Gloria!' laughed Anthony unwittingly. You can't get what you want ever, can you? I can't eat stuff, she flared up. I'll call back the waiter. I don't want you to. He doesn't know anything, the darn fool. Well, it isn't the hotel's fault. Either send it back, forget it, or be a sport and eat it. Shut up, she said succinctly. Why take it out on me? Oh, I'm not, she wailed, but I simply can't eat it. Anthony subsided helplessly. We'll go somewhere else, he suggested. I don't want to go anywhere else. I'm tired of being trotted around to a dozen cafes and not getting one thing fit to eat. When did we go around to a dozen cafes? You'd have to in this town, insisted Gloria with ready sophistry. Anthony, bewildered, tried another tack. Why don't you try to eat it? It can't be as bad as you think. Just because I don't like chicken. She picked up her fork and began poking contemptuously at the tomato, and Anthony expected her to begin flinging the stuffings in all directions. 
he was sure that she was approximately as angry as she had ever been. For an instant he had detected a spark of hate directed as much toward him as toward anyone else, and Gloria angry was, for the present, unapproachable. Then, surprisingly, he saw that she had tentatively raised the fork to her lips and tasted the chicken salad. Her frown had not abated, and he stared at her anxiously, making no comment, and daring scarcely to breathe. She tasted another forkful. In another moment she was eating. With difficulty Anthony restrained a chuckle. When at length he spoke, his words had no possible connection with chicken salad. This incident, with variations, ran like a lugubrious fugue through the first year of marriage. Always it left Anthony baffled, irritated, and depressed. But another rough brushing of temperaments, a question of laundry bags, he found even more annoying as it ended inevitably in a decisive defeat for him. One afternoon in Coronado, where they made the longest stay of their trip more than three weeks, Gloria was arraying herself brilliantly for tea. Anthony, who had been downstairs listening to the latest rumor bulletins of war in Europe, entered the room, kissed the back of her powdered neck, and went to his dresser. After a great pulling out and pushing in of drawers, evidently unsatisfactory, he turned around to the unfinished masterpiece. "'Got any handkerchiefs, Gloria?' he asked. Gloria shook her golden head. "'Not a one. I'm using one of yours. The last one, I deduce.' He laughed dryly. "'Is it?' She applied an emphatic, though very delicate, contour to her lips. "'Isn't the laundry back?' "'I don't know.' Anthony hesitated. Then, with sudden discernment, opened the closet door. His suspicions were verified. On the hook provided hung the blue bag furnished by the hotel. This was full of his clothes. He had put them there himself. The floor beneath it was littered with an astonishing mass of finery. Lingerie, stockings, dresses, nightgowns, and pajamas, most of it scarcely worn, but all of it coming indubitably under the general heading of Gloria's laundry. He stood holding the closet door open. Why, Gloria! What? The lip line was being erased and corrected according to some mysterious perspective. Not a finger trembled as she manipulated the lipstick. Not a glance wavered in his direction. It was a triumph of concentration. Haven't you ever sent out the laundry? Is it there? It most certainly is. Well, I guess I haven't then. Gloria, began Anthony, sitting down on the bed and trying to catch her mirrored eyes. "'You're a nice fellow, you are. I've sent it out every time it's been sent since we left New York, and over a week ago you promised you'd do it for a change. All you'd have to do would be to cram your own junk into that bag and ring for the chambermaid.' "'Oh, why fuss about the laundry?' exclaimed Gloria petulantly. "'I'll take care of it.' "'I haven't fussed about it. I'd just as soon divide the bother with you, but when we're out of handkerchiefs it's darn near time something's done.' Anthony considered that he was being extraordinarily logical. But Gloria, unimpressed, put away her cosmetics and casually offered him her back. "'Hook me up,' she suggested. "'Anthony, dearest, I forgot all about it. I meant to, honestly, and I will today. Don't be cross with your sweetheart.' What could Anthony do then but draw her down upon his knee and kiss a shade of color from her lips? "'But I don't mind,' she murmured with a smile, radiant and magnanimous. You can kiss all the paint off my lips any time you want. They went down to tea. They bought some handkerchiefs in a notion store nearby. All was forgotten. But two days later Anthony looked in the closet and saw the bag still hung limp upon its hook, and that the gay and vivid pile on the floor had increased surprisingly in height. Gloria! he cried. Oh! Her voice was full of real distress. Despairingly, Anthony went to the phone and called the chambermaid. "'It seems to me,' he said impatiently, "'that you expect me to be some sort of French valet to you.' Gloria laughed, so infectiously that Anthony was unwise enough to smile. Unfortunate man. In some intangible manner his smile made her mistress of the situation. With an air of injured righteousness she went emphatically to the closet and began pushing her laundry violently into the bag. Anthony watched her, ashamed of himself. "'There,' she said, 
implying that her fingers had been worked to the bone by a brutal taskmaster. He considered, nevertheless, that he had given her an object lesson, and that the matter was closed, but on the contrary it was merely beginning. Laundry pile followed laundry pile, at long intervals. Dareth of handkerchief followed dareth of handkerchief, at short ones. Not to mention dareth of sock, of shirt, of everything. And Anthony found at length that either he must send it out himself, or go through the increasingly unpleasant ordeal of a verbal battle with Gloria. Gloria and General Lee On their way east they stopped two days in Washington, strolling about with some hostility in its atmosphere of harsh repellent light, of distance without freedom, of pomp without splendor. It seemed a pasty, pale, and self-conscious city. The second day they made an ill-advised trip to General Lee's old home at Arlington. The bus which bore them was crowded with hot, unprosperous people, and Anthony, intimate to Gloria, felt a storm brewing. It broke at the zoo, where the party stopped for ten minutes. The zoo, it seemed, smelt of monkeys. Anthony laughed. Gloria called down the curse of heaven upon monkeys, including in her malevolence all the passengers of the bus and their perspiring offspring who had hide themselves monkeyward. Eventually the bus moved on to Arlington. There it met other buses, and immediately a swarm of women and children were leaving a trail of peanut shells through the halls of General Lee, and crowding at length into the room where he was married. On the wall of this room a pleasing sign announced in large red letters, Ladies' Toilet. At this final blow Gloria broke down. I think it's perfectly terrible, she said furiously. The idea of letting these people come here, and of encouraging them by making these houses show places. Well, objected Anthony, if they weren't kept up they'd go to pieces. What if they did? she exclaimed as they sought the wide pillared porch. Do you think they've left a breath of 1860 here? This has become a thing of 1914. Don't you want to preserve old things? But you can't, Anthony. Beautiful things grow to a certain height, and then they fail and fade off, breathing out memories as they decay. And just as any period decays in our minds, the things of that period should decay too. And in that way they're preserved for a while in the few hearts like mine that react to them. That graveyard at Tarrytown, for instance, the asses who give money to preserve things have spoiled that, too. Sleepy Hollow's gone, Washington Irving's dead, and his books are rotting in our estimation year by year. Then let the graveyard rot, too, as it should, as all things should. Trying to preserve a century by keeping its relics up to date is like keeping a dying man alive by stimulants. So you think that just as the time goes to pieces, its houses ought to go, too? Of course! Would you value your Keats letter if the signature was traced over to make it last longer? It's just because I love the past that I want this house to look back on its glamorous moment of youth and beauty, and I want its stairs to creak as if to the footsteps of women with hoop skirts and men in boots and spurs. But they've made it into a blondined, rouged-up old woman of sixty. It hasn't any right to look so prosperous. It might care enough for Lee to drop a brick now and then. How many of these... these animals... She waved her hand around. Get anything from this, for all the histories and guidebooks and restorations in existence. How many of them who think that, at best, appreciation is talking in undertones and walking on tiptoes would even come here if it was any trouble? I want it to smell of magnolias instead of peanuts, and I want my shoes to crunch on the same gravel that Lee's boots crunched on. There's no beauty without poignancy, and there's no poignancy without the feeling that it's going. Men, names, books, houses, bound for dust, mortal. A small boy appeared beside them, and, swinging a handful of banana peels, flung them valiantly in the direction of the Potomac. Sentiment Simultaneously with the fall of Liege, Anthony and Gloria arrived in New York. In retrospect, the six weeks seemed miraculously happy. They had found, to a great extent, as most young couples find in some measure, that they possessed in common many fixed ideas and curiosities and odd quirks of mind. They were essentially companionable. But it had been a struggle to keep many of their conversations on the level of discussions. Arguments were fatal to Gloria's disposition. She had, all her life, been associated either with her mental inferiors or with men who, under the almost hostile intimidation of her beauty, had not dared to contradict her. 
Naturally, then, it irritated her when Anthony emerged from the state in which her pronouncements were an infallible and ultimate decision. He failed to realize, at first, that this was the result partly of her female education and partly of her beauty, and he was inclined to include her with her entire sex as curiously and definitely limited. It maddened him to find she had no sense of justice, but he discovered that, when a subject did interest her, her brain tired less quickly than his. What he chiefly missed in her mind was the pedantic teleology, the sense of order and accuracy, the sense of life as a mysteriously correlated piece of patchwork, but he understood after a while that such a quality in her would have been incongruous. Of the things they possessed in common, greatest of all was their almost uncanny pull at each other's hearts. The day they left the hotel in Coronado, she sat down on one of the beds while they were packing and began to weep bitterly. Dearest, his arms were around her, he pulled her head down upon his shoulder. What is it, my own Gloria? Tell me. We're going away, she sobbed. Oh, Anthony, it's sort of the first place we've lived together. Our two little beds here, side by side. They'll always be waiting for us, and we're never coming back to em any more. She was tearing at his heart as she always could. Sentiment came over him, rushed into his eyes. Gloria, why, we're going on to another room, and two other little beds. We're going to be together all our lives. Words flooded from her in a low, husky voice. But it won't be like our two beds ever again. Everywhere we go and move on and change, something's lost, something's left behind. You can't ever quite repeat anything, and I've been so yours here. He held her passionately near, discerning far beyond any criticism of her sentiment, a wise grasping of the minute, if only an indulgence of her desire to cry. Gloria the idler, caresser of her own dreams, extracting poignancy from the memorable things of life and youth. Later in the afternoon, when he returned from the station with the tickets, he found her asleep on one of the beds, her arm curled about a black object which he could not at first identify. Coming closer, he found it was one of his shoes, not a particularly new one, nor clean one, but her face, tear-stained, was pressed against it and he understood her ancient and most honorable message. There was almost ecstasy in waking her and seeing her smile at him, shy but well aware of her own nicety of imagination. With no appraisal of the worth or dross of these two things, it seemed to Anthony that they lay somewhere near the heart of love. End of Book Two, Chapter One, Part Two of Three